Well, hello there, Vineyard family. Welcome to this webcast today. I could not be more excited about our time together. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Christina Lowry, and I am the Associate National Director of Church Health and Development. And our heart and passion is that we, the Vineyard, would be a movement of multiplying churches and that we would raise up leaders who um, embrace multiplication at every level. We want to see disciples multiplied and leaders multiplied. And ultimately, we want to see churches uh, multiplied all over our country and around the world. And so I could not be more excited about our webcast today. This uh, webcast has been entitled Becoming a Multiplier. And we have two incredible guests joining with us today. Um, one of them you may have already met at our national conference. We have Bill Kokenauer with Exponential. He is the um, Executive Director of Deployment with Exponential. And he uh, taught one of our workshops, um, was present at many of our workshops, uh, building a cultural multiplication and this guy just has a world of wisdom that I can't wait for him to share with you today. Um, Bill, why don't you say hi to everybody joining us? Hi, uh, Christina. Hello, everybody. It's great to be with you. Uh, we're we're excited. We're as excited as you are, I think, today to be with you. Yes, this beautiful partnership and relationship that we're building, and um, we're really excited to hear from you today. We are also um, so excited to welcome Ben Connolly, who is, um, he is a church planter, he is um, a pastor, and he is the founder of the Equipping Group, and he will actually be leading and facilitating our upcoming Multipliers Learning Community that um, is going to start this fall in November. And so we could not be more thrilled, Ben, to have you with us today. Thanks. I'm honored to meet you. I'm trying to figure out why my video is not showing up, but you can stare at my uh, bearded <laughs> face here in just a sec. It oh, is actually what right, I shaved. I there shaved just now. <laughs> <laughs> Good to meet you, Christina. Good to see you all. You too, Ben. Yes, we we have become friends on email, but we finally get to see each other face to face. That's right. Yes. <laughs> So good to have both of you. Well, for those of you that are joining in, um, just a little vision for our time together is that, um, you know, we have these two guys who would love to share with you a little bit more about what it means to become and be someone who uh, multiplies. Um, you know, we're, we're, as I mentioned before, we uh, would love to see healthy discipleship making, um, you know, leaders who champion reproduction at every level. And um, so we're going to hand it over in just a moment, but I thought we could um, start with just a, a moment of prayer, and then I will uh, let these guys go at it. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our time together. We thank you for the blessing that you've given us in the vineyard, the gift that you've given us, Father. And um, we we know that the best way that we can steward this legacy of our movement is that we would um, that we would be good stewards, that we would invest into our movement by multiplying what you've given us. And so, Lord, we just offer up this time to you today. I pray that our hearts would be open, that our ears and our eyes and our minds would be open to receive from you, to know your heart in building your kingdom, to know your strategy in building your kingdom and and how you so desire to see us multiply at every level, God. We love you. We thank you so much for your presence here in our time together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to let them go for it, but I did want to let everybody know that there is a Q&A feature. And so anytime as they're teaching, if you have a question about anything, uh, we may respond to you directly, but if it's something that we feel like everybody wants may want to to hear from them about, we will. Uh, I will pop in and kind of bring some of those questions um, throughout. I know um, watching Bill at work at the conference, this is always very conversational, and he loves to hear your questions. So um, feel free to pop in those questions at any time. But without any further ado, I'm going to hand it off to you guys. Thanks. Appreciate it, Christina. And the way, kind of the way we set this time up, Ben and I are splitting our time. I'm kind of setting up the the frameworks and sort of the challenge. Ben actually gets to be the one that tells you what you can do about it. So 
Uh, so he yeah. will, uh, he'll be the one, he, he actually plays the hero story in this, uh, this particular webinar, but, uh, yeah, we, um, uh, you mentioned the, the multipliers learning communities and actually this framework that I want to share comes out of what really was the forerunner of those learning communities called future travelers. And, um, initially just briefly, it was a, a group of about 11 me mega church pastors and a guy by the name of Alan Hirsch. If, if anybody happens to know Alan, um, that was a, an unusual gathering, especially uh, 12, 13 years ago, however long ago it was. Um, but these uh, pastors are really re wrestling with, um, you know, they were they were uh, literally some of the best in the country. I would say most, if not all, were on Outreach Magazine's top 100, at least two would have been in the top 10. Yet there was a, a dissatisfaction with um, uh, with what was happening, and th I think it was there were two things that they were primarily um, dissatisfied with. One was uh, this idea of, um, in fact, the, the very first pastor said, I'm not interested in the next one, the next service, the next campus. I'm interested in how do we release 250 our people to take the city for Jesus. And so there was a, while they were in terms of addition, were, you know, the best that um, some of the best out there they knew there was something more. Uh, the second thing I think that they were wrestling with was, uh, are we creating more consumers of Christian goods and services and we are actual disciples? And so, so that frame, the, the framework that I want to share with you kind of really came out of what, I mean, we didn't have language for it back then, but this really, I think kind of explains the, the angst that, uh, that they have. So I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here and, uh, and we'll kind of walk, uh, walk through this together. So the uh, the very first um, slide that I want to show you here is where we initially started looking at, okay, how many uh, how many churches are uh, multiplying, how many are adding? And we really just started with uh, kind of with math, you know, just um, God made math. So we started there and uh, figured there are some churches certainly that are in decline. There are some churches that are growing and there's some churches that are multiplying. Um, as we uh, got into it more, we realized there were some that were kind of in between those, um, some that weren't really subtracting, but they weren't really adding, and they're kind of in that in-between spot. Uh, there were other churches that were uh, multipl were uh, moving toward multiplication, but not quite multiplication, really. And so, uh, but they were doing something more than adding. So we we ended up with five levels. It's, uh, th there's not a... Uh, we didn't pull a biblical reference. We didn't try to proof text it or anything like that. But uh, but we ended up with with these five levels. So level one, subtracting, and these are um, really you know, simply just what they say. These are churches that um, may have been in decline. Um, uh, you know, maybe it's an older church that's been in decline. Maybe you know, oftentimes we launch church plants into level one. There's not enough income coming in uh, from the very beginning that. Um, and so they're really launched in that level one, that tension, uh, that financial tension of, you know, how are we going to meet our bills from from week to week? The second one is uh, what we call plateauing. These are ones that, again, are not really subtracting, but they're not really adding to any great degree. And and sometimes you'll see that in uh, maybe there's been a, a church that's been in decline. There's been a leadership change and it's just kind of leveled off. Uh, or a church that had been growing and um, and they they begun to kind of hit a peak and have leveled off, or even that that church plant that um, now has has grown to the point where they've got their head above water financially, but uh, but they're still not really hitting any growth to any great degree. Level three, this is what we typically champion. Uh, these are the uh, churches that that hit level three are marked by that um, you know the. Uh, able to break through the 100 barrier, the 500 barrier, the 1,000 barrier, so on. Um, you know, they're often, they're the ones that are typically uh, pushing the envelope on on ways to to gather people and grow. Um, it is the the focus that typically the, the primary metrics of success for level three churches, uh, and honestly, for level one, level two, two churches that aspire to be level three, the primary metrics of success seem to be around um, addition and accumulation. So we can we can attendance, giving, uh, sometimes small group attendance, that sort of thing. Now, where this gets interesting is in level four. Now, these are churches now that have begun to reproduce outside themselves. 
they've now begun to they've, they've um, started some things or they're investing in some things that um, that are around sending and releasing. And this is where you see begin to see a shift in the, the primary metrics of success, where level four now is starting to measure things like um, raising up church planters, the number of church plants they're sending, the um, how uh, uh, even sometimes you even see um, metrics around uh, community transformation, uh, you know, percentage of people coming to Christ, that sort of thing. Um, and level four, it, it really is, uh, particularly churches that have moved uh, distinctly into level four, is there's a uh, there is a mindset shift and um and i'll give you an example so larry walkmeyer is another one of our facilitators that are learning communities and uh, he uh he found out that uh, a couple people autumn and daniel that uh in a, a cohort that i was facilitating were planting a church in long beach and larry and his wife deb uh, uh planted and uh, or pastored L uh, light and life fellowship in long beach california for 31 years and just now handed that off. And he's now the, the director of church multiplication for the Free Methodist Church. But he found out that Autumn and Daniel were planting a church in Long Beach. And long story short, Larry brings Autumn and Daniel into their church, tells some of his people that, hey, or, or tells all of his people, God's calling some of you to go with them to plant this church. Larry's church also becomes the number one funder of that church. Now, the interesting thing is that church isn't in Larry's denomination. Hmm. The only reason you know about it, I know about it, is because Autumn and Daniel happened to be in my cohort. There's there's no other earthly scorecard that Larry gets credit other than kind of his, um, how he measures things. And that really started, they had a, uh, he and his wife Deb were um, away praying and what they, uh, interestingly, both individually felt like what the Holy Spirit was impressing on them was that you're a lake church growing it bigger and bigger. You need to become a river church mm -hmm. where, where you're sending and releasing really some of your best. So that's a, that distinction between level three and level four is what is I think really important. The, the next um, level is multiplying and one, a couple of ways to think about level five. One way to think about it is um, that it's, you can think of a reproduction to the fourth generation. So a church that's planted a church that's planted a church or in disciple making, a, a disciple who's made a disciple who's made a disciple who's made a disciple. The, the significance of that is that um, there's a there's a DNA that's birthed in there when it's done like that. When when you're when you're doing disciple making in the way that of, of making disciples, that that really is is kind of Jesus' way of multiplication. That that is kingdom multiplication, and so uh, so we sometimes think about level five being multiplication to the fifth generation, or some way where um, where the multiplication is not just embedded; that it is actually embedded in the DNA of the church, of the people in the church. And probably the best example that we have of that is uh, Ralph Moore. Ralph, uh, uh, I, when. I actually was using Ralph as an example of level five for a number of years because uh, I came across a book that Ed Setzer and Warren Bird wrote called Viral Churches. And in there, they essentially said that Hope Chapel, the Hope Chapel movement, the name of the churches that Ralph was planning, uh, was that, that um, movement was so embedded in what they were doing that if they wanted to stop multiplication, they'd actually have to put a, a strategy in place, intentional strategy in place to stop the multiplication. And we we saw that that borne out when um, when Ralph first came to Exponential probably seven years ago now he knew he'd be asked how many churches have been planted out of the stream of Hope Chapel and I think Hope Chapel planted seventy six churches so they went out to those churches and found out you know who they planted and who they planted and who they planted and they found two thousand three hundred twenty two churches that tied their roots back to those seventy some churches that Ralph. Um, and Hope Chapel originally planted uh, seven generations deep, in one case, nine generations deep. And keep in mind, that was seven years ago. So, you know, and again, some of those churches have died now. Some of those churches reverted back to level three. But many of those churches just continue to um, to move on. So you get that. Hold on, Bill. Let me just because you yeah. said it so quickly. Did you just say over 2000 churches? <laughs> 2,322 churches. We found 2,000. They found two, in the, the initial research, they found 2,318. 
And in between there and the next time I saw Ralph, they found four more. So he corrected me. That's why I remember that number, 2,322. He goes, no, it's up. And then they just, you know, lot you know. And actually, that's a good way to know if if somebody asks how many have been plant, how many churches have been planted out of the stream of the churches you've planted, and you don't know right away, it's a good indication you yeah. might be level five. Um, wow, that's incredible. Um, so that yeah, and I think yeah. So it's again these you know we could have gone with seven levels. We could I, I think five was the simplest way um, to really look at that, and then uh, something that we we saw really interesting is that. If you think of a magnet, there's a magnet at level three. Um, you're, we're we're drawn to to being the best level three. We're, we're uh, again, if the primary metric is around uh, addition accumulation, around uh, weekend attendance, and that sort of thing, that's where we, that's how we oftentimes um, assess planters. It's how we train planters. It's um, there are guides on you know how to how to create great greeters. There's, you know, every aspect of, of adding. I mean, there, there are some um, church planning groups that can tell you exactly the equipment you need that you can set up and tear down in the shortest period of time in a, in a high school uh, auditorium or different places like that. So we're, we're, we're drawn to that. I actually did um, one year at about, there were 60 or 70 pastors in the room and I asked how many have read Purpose Driven Church? And it was interesting uh, almost everybody over 30 had read it. Almost everybody under 30 had not. But everybody under 30 doesn't need to read it because it's embedded in how we train and assess church planners. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about that magnet is that it works in both directions. In other words, the, the many of the things, and perhaps most of the things that you do in some cases to be a great level three church become the very things that make it difficult to move to level four and five. And so if you think about... Um, uh, you just even think about the 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 way you staff, the way that you know. Oftentimes, we, you've got more and more people coming now, and so there's an investment in in buildings and facilities, and oftentimes there's a debt that comes with that, and and it's difficult to to send and release. Go back to those original future traveler pastors, and one of them said, "How do I have a 17 million dollar debt? How do I think about sending and releasing when I have that kind of commitment?" Uh, even in in terms of of recruiting people, um, there was one church. I'm thinking, granted, these are really large churches, but one said we have to recruit 934 workers for youth and children every week. How do I think about sending and releasing when when it takes that kind of focus to recruit that many people? And so it's um, and even even if you think about um, the way you staff now the. The, the staff that you're bringing on hand are for programs and things that are already taking place for the people that are there. And even the social contract you make with your people, if, you know, if, if, if you've um, kind of made either uh, explicitly or implicitly said, hey, come here and we'll give you meaningful worship, a relevant message, uh, we'll help educate your kids in the faith, we'll, um, uh, we'll give you a place you're not embarrassed to bring your neighbors to and, and, and kind of make it that's this is how we this is how we do this is our um, a form of ecclesiology and then you turn around and say no we actually want you to think about being a full-time you're, you're a full-time missionary you just don't draw a paycheck from the church we want you to be a missionary in your community or take the example with larry walker we want we feel like god's calling some of you to leave this church to go be a part of that team to plant that new church it's like well wait a minute you told me and so the whole idea of what you win them with you win them too and so that's uh that magnet has um just in, in fact a lot of times when when i talk to pastors uh, the 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 comment i'll get sometimes is you give words to the angst that i was feeling like there was that sense and oftentimes it comes from successful level three uh pastors um but that that idea that there that we knew there were, I knew there was something that wasn't quite quite right, and even uh, we go back to the original future traveler pastors, and this this really, in essence, is is what they were saying. Uh, a couple of things, uh, a couple of points I want to make with this is first of all, none of this has to do with the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is no no more powerful in level five than level one. I mean, the gospel is the gospel. What we're what we're really talking about here is uh, is the paradigm. Like uh, you know, paradigms are like glasses. You know, if I if I take my glasses off, the world seems different to me. 
it doesn't change the fact out there. But when I put my glasses on, I'm like, I'm seeing it differently. I'm seeing it differently. I'm actually seeing it better. And so um, our paradigm and our way of thinking um, about doing church, about ecclesiology, I think is important in, in setting up um, for in posturing ourselves to where multiplication can actually happen. So, so none of these levels have anything to do with, in fact, most of your, uh, if you're like most, churches, uh, most denominations, most samples, you know, um, I think we have a hundred or so people on here. My guess is 80% of you are in level one, level two churches aspiring to be level three. And so there, um, there's nothing to be embarrassed about that or, or, um, you know, the gospel is still the gospel. The other thing that I would say is that, um, it doesn't have to be linear. Um, one of the kind of the, the downside of this um, framework is that if you're a church planter starting out, you you know it looks like you got to go through level three, and actually you've got a better chance of getting to level four and level five by avoiding level three altogether. And we're we're seeing more and more churches like that. Um, there's a church uh, I know that. Um, yeah, long story short, the the pastor ran into somebody who said, "Hey, I love your website." Well, they didn't have a website. They had the name incorporated, but they didn't have the website. Found out there was another church that was planning in the same area with the same name. They had a choice to, to shut that other church down. What they ended up doing is giving that church a third of the money they had raised. They had raised $15,000 for their church plan. They gave a third of that away to the other church. That embedded a DNA in them right from the beginning that when they started their first publicly advertised weekend gathering in a theater, they on that day announced who would be planting out of that church. And they've gone on to, you know, to just, you know, uh, I, you know, arguably level five now. Um, and so they avoided that altogether. So I don't know, if, uh, Christina, do you have any questions or any, um, anything, yeah. well, I a, a rapid run through of that, but. Yeah, no, this is so good. And, you know, just to give a frame of reference for the vineyard movement, we've, we've always, you know, champion church planting. We've called ourselves a church planting movement. Um, that's how we grew um, in the early days and how we've continued to expand in, in the past couple of decades. And I love the analogy that you gave early on about the difference between, between being a lake church and a river church. Yeah. And I think there is a shift right now that's happening in the vineyard of, uh, be, you know, becoming that kind of a church that is has the mindset and the mentality and the paradigm of we exist so that we can release and send out even more and um and and what the question that I would ask though is because uh, I love I love how you said uh church church planters actually should aim to to plant at a level four church rather than planting at a level three church. And I'd love for you to speak into, does planting as a level four, four church require a certain size? Um, are, are we, is there, is there a, a size that would give you enough momentum to go into planting as a level four church? Yeah, you're, what you're speaking to is the financial model of the church and, and the financial model of the prevailing model of the church is, uh, weekend attendance and giving, and and so that is a consideration when, you know, if you're if you want to move to level four right from the beginning, um, I think it's more a mindset than it is a size. Um, I've I, you know I've talked to Ralph will say, you know, 150, you know, is the right size to begin planning out. Uh, there's another church I know of in Louisiana that um, when they, they they never get a once they get to 350, they'll send out people and plant. Um, I, but I think it's more of a mindset than, than anything, you know, um, they, uh, it's the old story of, you know, you ask a millionaire, well, how much money is enough money? And he says, just a little bit more, you know, how big is big enough to plant? Well, just a little bit bigger. And, and I think it, it, it takes a commitment and a mindset and, and also it's rooted in disciple making. So, you know, just, um, I, I mean, I'm, I have been amazed at how few, vocational pastors are doing any intentional disciple making mm -hmm. uh, and and I, really that's that's the place to start that's even even you know think about how you build um launch teams and lead teams and what they do in the initial stages before church plant i think if the focus can stay on there um i uh, 
tell this real quickly, but uh, I had three conversations, almost identical conversations with church planters last year, essentially saying, hey, um, uh, I'm planting a church, so-and-so said I should talk to you, and, and we talk, and they go, yeah, we're going to be planting in, in five months, and I said, well, tell me what you've do been doing. I goes, oh, it's amazing. We've got this leadership team, and they've been growing, and we've been reaching people, and we're baptizing people, and you know, my the third time it happened, my question was, well, what happens in five months that legitimizes you as a church? Hmm. Right? And just really encourage them to change the language. You may be starting a publicly advertised weekend gathering, but man, you everything you're doing right now, my fear is if a level three mindset, 90% of that effort's going into actually being a church and, and evangelizing and discipling people, a big chunk of that goes into now putting an event on on the weekend. And so thinking in terms of how do you think in terms of that weekend gathering to serve what happens during the week instead of everything during the week being um, orchestrated to put on something on the weekend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, and I would just one more question add in for those, I mean, you even guessed right that many of the churches joining here today and really um, in, in with our census data, we know that many of our churches are level one, level two, and even at a level three, what would you say to those churches um, of of what they should be aiming for in that place? Um, are would you say that they should aim past level three and and start moving towards level four, or do you do you feel like they need to get to a certain place? This is kind of the same question, but now more like yep. looking at one and two. You've actually just set Ben up for what. Right. He, <laughs> so with the five point, let let me hit two other things real quick. I, I do, I know from sharing this framework over the number of years that there, there are tensions that um, mm -hmm. that that you feel like once you see that, whether you're aspiring to be level three or you're a successful level three church, but you know there's something wrong and you want to move on, there are there are tensions that you feel. Some are external tensions. You know, should we, and some of what you've talked about here, should we grow our, our, our current attendance or start new places? Should we prioritize financial stability here or commit resources sending out? Should we uh, draw more people by offering comfort and you know, better things or challenge them to live sacrificially? You know, sometimes it's internal challenges. You know, your your ego. I've I've had, uh, you know, Larry Wachemeyer that we mentioned. In fact, Flow, his book Flow, where he talks about uh, moving from a lake to a river church, and he talks about some of these tensions. Uh, it'd be good when we do the email to everybody here. That's a free download. We can um, send them that link as well. But he talks about these, um, and you know, before Larry moved from a, a, a lake to a river church, they had received the plaque for the fastest growing church in the denomination. Mm -hmm. So he had to he had to take that plaque, put it aside, and go. That uh, wow. that's not going to be my priority here. And so now to Christina, to get back to your question, Ben, I'll let you kind of um, take it from here. When we think about, you know, where you need to move, how do you move beyond the level three magnet or, or even level three kind of thinking? Yeah, I'm honored. And, and again, like for those who are doing learning community this coming year, um, it's, it's beyond humbling to know that we'll get to walk together and consider these and, for me, I've been in local church ministry for 23 years. And so these are some shifts that that we've had to make in a few different churches that I've helped start and lead. Um, I recognize that that they're not easy. Um, but but Christina, the question you asked is is the right question. Like if it's if it's going to be just this aspirational thing that we talk about, then there's nothing that needs to change. And yet that's not the heart here um, and the heart for anyone joining in. It's to go, okay, how do we take that aspiration and actually make it real? Um, and I want to suggest that all five of these shifts are really about our church's culture. Um, yes, vision, but but culture especially. Because um, on one level, to kind of speak to traditional church setups uh, at times, not everyone is like this, but but multiplication can live under the responsibility of just the missions department or the missions pastor while the rest of the church has what feels like a competing goal. Um, and that can be so common in our kind of segmented leadership structure um, that the missions pastor alone is, is thinking about multiplication. Um, and that's one of the problems that keeps us at this level three or two or one. Uh, but I think perhaps another problem is even bigger than that. And that's even if the church has a vision for multiplication, it's our cultures that hold us back. It's our cultures that we've created that become just the water we swim in, 
uh, that, that matter most. Um, we do a lot of training with, with church planters and pastors and tell them everything in our cultures, language, budget finances, where time goes, our priorities, all of those things either work for our vision or distract from our vision. And we all know this, uh, if, if we have to choose between believing a vision that we hear versus a culture that we feel lived, culture is always going to win, no matter what someone says from this stage. Um, and so, yeah, to that end, like exponential talks a lot. We talk a lot about five shifts in culture that are, that are really hard. And I want to say that at the, at the offset, they're really hard and they take a lot of dependence and a lot of trust and risk, but, but they're really vital for, for churches to become truly multiplying. And the first is already on your screen. Uh, it's a shift from hero to hero maker. Um, and that's language from, from Dave Ferguson and Warren Bird. But this might be what we call the pastoral shift. Uh, it goes from the leader being the hero, which is kind of the common expectation that's out there. But the shift is from the leader being the hero to the leader becoming a mentor who creates other heroes, who then become mentors who create other heroes and, and on and on and on. And so Bill already mentioned kind of four generations that's that's pulled from Second Timothy 2, which is a familiar verse that Paul receives what, uh, what he was given and passes it on to others and equips them to teach still others and so on and so forth. And again, like that's a hard shift to make because uh, it goes against so much of, of, of church culture today um, where pastors are looked at as professionals. Uh, church leaders can feel like we're on pedestals. Maybe perhaps in our heart, we know we kind of like being on the pedestal. And so we put ourselves there. But even if we despise it, if we're honest, kind of the, the Western church culture invites pastors to to be on that pedestal. Um, pastors are looked at at times, whether we want to be or not, as as heroes or holier or higher. And in some ways, like we're kind of the mediators in some people's eyes between God and, and, and our people, his people. Um and frankly, it feels good to be on the top, but, but the hero mentality is, is just inherently flawed. Like theologically it's flawed because we would say, and we all preach this and this kind of stuff, like there is no hero other than Jesus. Um, right. we are simply his stewards, simply his servants. Uh, shepherd is the language that's primarily used in the new Testament. Our role is to point the sheep to a better hero, to, to point God's people back to Jesus. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming someone on this call feels this, like if we have to be the hero, then we either have to hide our flaws or our church starts to reflect our flaws. Mm. Um, and so this hero to hero maker shift um, for me started about 10 years into ministry uh, when I felt a lot of that pressure. And frankly, we had a, a really, you know, quote unquote, by metrics standards, a, a somewhat successful ministry. Um, but then we started to invite kind of a co-pastor and its team model. Um, and people are like, what's going on here? But but for me, it was so freeing. Mm -hmm. And for our church, like we don't know each other well, but but if 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 I was left to lead by myself, then our church would be really strong, moving the ball down the field, and everybody would be really, really tired and spiritually drained. Mm -hmm. That's that's my bent, that's my nature. There's pros and cons in that. And so Matt, the gentleman who came alongside to, to help lead. And then after, after Matt and Nicole and another guy named Matt and Michaela and all these people, as we built it out, like they were, and some of them are really gifted shepherds. Mm -hmm. Um, if Matt led the church by himself, man, we would feel so cared for and so deeply loved. And we would all just sit around and sing songs together and cry. Yeah. Um, that's his bent for pros and, and cons. So we need each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then together, the church starts to raise up others and, and help people see like, oh, you can thrive in ministry as well, even if you're gifted in areas that so-and-so is not or this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so Hero to Hero Maker says others get to discover the role they have in God's kingdom. And the church, frankly, becomes more holistic and, and well-shaped in different areas. So that, that's the shift. It's hero to hero maker. It's countercultural, requires a ton of humility. It's, it takes risk, means giving away responsibility. And frankly, people might squander that responsibility. Um, and so for that to happen, it takes a second shift. And by all means, I know we're, we're taking questions here. So I'm going to run through. We're, we're doing a high level thing here. So as people have questions, post them in the Q&A. We'll come back to them at the end. 
but the second shift flows from and really enables that shift from from hero to hero maker and that's a shift in the score scorecard uh if the first was kind of the pastoral shift this is the metrics shift what do we count what matters most um and we know this like the stories we tell the things we celebrate from the stage like we create culture by telling people what we celebrate because that's what people will then celebrate as well um, and so just to be over general about it, this becomes a shift from counting the number of people in the church to counting the percentage of a population changed. Um, another way we talk about it is from accumulation to transformation. Um, but, but a third way to talk about it, and this is maybe my favorite, it's a friend of mine who, oh, I was going to say jokingly, only half jokingly says that churches commonly measure metrics in the same way that would be like a bakery relying on their raw materials delivered to define success mm -hmm. rather than the loaves sold or the the product made and sent out and this kind of stuff. Wow. And I love it because it's basically like saying, oh, look how much flour was delivered today. Look <laughs> how many sticks of butter we got. We did it. Um, and of course, that's silly, but... But the, I think the point carries. M most of the common metrics across the Western church are about the number of people in the door mm -hmm. or the number of dollars in the plate or the number of people on our member rosters and this kind of stuff. And to be clear, I don't think we should disregard those outright. Like it is helpful to see trends. It's right to celebrate God's work, uh, baptism, new people becoming part of a community. These, these are not inherently bad things but the drive toward more and bigger and better and accumulation is far more uh, a metric of the world than it is than it is god um because jesus's invitation is always to depth more than it is width and a lot of the reports of growth and this kind of stuff you see even in the new testament is is not because it's their goal it's the it's it's just the outflow of god's work Jesus's charge is not to grow big, but, but rather to make, make disciples. Um, so in Fort Worth, I get to help serve with a group of about 50 churches, um, who come together for the sake of planting churches. Fort Worth is right now the fastest growing large city in the U S. And so we want to see 200 churches planted in our city and from our city and the commitment for plant Fort Worth, this group that comes together is kingdom over church. And that's not to say we we pretend we don't have differences. Like every church gets to value kind of secondary doctrines and their specific ministry philosophy. But but every church also recognizes we all have one tiny piece of the kingdom pie in Fort Worth. And if that's true, then we all get to celebrate kingdom collaboration. And so we've seen churches from one denomination kind of echoing what Bill already said about Bill's uh, about uh, Larry's church. Excuse me. Um, churches from one denomination or networks and not just money, but people to help a new plant. Um, there's one, at least one example where someone came to Jesus in one church, but was baptized in another church because he had more friends and community and that became his church home. And the first church, it was a question for him. Like, do we celebrate that? Like he came to Jesus in us. Does he belong to us? I think is often the question there. Mm -hmm. um, and so what if in addition to input metrics, like we started to track leaders trained or the number of quote unquote lay people in discipleship relationships or how many gospel conversations are being had or how many what, what what percentage of our budget is given away like what if we paid more attention to kingdom impact and city impact in addition to or instead of church growth and cared about what we sent out more than what came in um that's the the shift in the bakery. Look, look, here's what we actually produced and sent out and fed people with. I mean, the, the, the metaphor breaks down, of course, but that's a shift in the scorecard. I might stop there for a sec and see if there's anything to press into before we talk about the other couple shifts. Uh, let's see, we have a question here. Are there different dynamics to work through coming from a rural city? It's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. I might answer it in, in a similar way of what Bill mentioned as far as like the size question goes. Um, like there, there's often a mindset in churches, we have to get to a certain dollar amount size leaders. We're going to come back to this actually in a sec. Um, but, but it's much more of a mind, a, a mindset change. Um, and frankly, if I can even add to some of what Bill said, um, 
if church planting is the first time that multiplication language is used or reproduction language is used, then we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, Cause reproducing starts with false, far smaller areas within our church. And so what does it look like for, for groups to reproduce and send out new small groups or for someone to, to realize they have a gift of, of teaching and have a few folks that come around them and within the construct of whatever church they're in, start a new Sunday school class or start a new ministry or this kind of stuff. And so stuff like that can happen. Big churches, small churches, rich churches, poor churches, urban churches, rural churches, suburban churches, everything in between. And so it is a lot more about a, a mindset shift in the culture. Um, of course, there are specific nuances to, to rural churches that are different than urban churches. And some things make it easier and some things make it harder. And um, but if the lead edge is, okay, God, what do you have for us? And, and how do you want us as our specific church to pursue your kingdom? Then it might even take away some of the comparative. Um, cause who cares if somebody looks like they're doing more or less than your churches, uh, we're called to shepherd the flocks of God that are among each of us. And so what's right for my church, God's church, but you know what I'm saying for this church in this moment, um, rather than comparing and contrasting. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, just to like agree with that, I, I, I know that we've even seen in our own, my local church, um, you get, you get people, you know, from different ministries in the church, Hey, can you announce from the stage that we need more help in this area? So that is the mindset of, of, you know, the pastor is going to multiply us or, and, and shifting that mindset of, no, we need you as a team member or a team leader that you are actually going to reproduce what you have. <laughs> and, um, and what we found is that that is a much more sustainable model than to have someone make an announcement from the stage and, and all of that. It, it really is um, a shift in mindset and it doesn't, it, that, that goes across any context, whether you're in a yeah. small town or you're in a metropolis. Yeah. And for the second time in our webinar, you're setting up the next two shifts extremely well <laughs> because, <laughs> because it does shift from just Luckily the professional. Goes with you, I, it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Come Lord. <laughs> That's right. It's almost like you sat through some of this before and know where we're headed. <laughs> oh, no, it's good. It's unity because and, and, and uh, we're joking, but you're absolutely right because all of these things are so interrelated. And, and so again, if it is just a, an announcement from the stage or this kind of stuff, that'll get a few folks, uh, kind of the juices flowing or, or maybe they might raise their hand, but, but what has to come alongside the announcements or the asks or that kind of stuff in any church, um, are these other two, these next two cultural shifts, um, and they're interrelated, but they flow exactly from what Christina was just say, saying, um, and it's a shift in both expectations for every believer and also the opportunities we give them. Um, and so on one hand, like if the pastor or church leader is the hero, um, then they're not going to be the hero maker, but if they shift that and they become the hero maker, then, then who gets to be the hero? And we've already said theologically, of course, Jesus is the only hero, but then everyone else if we're primarily sons and daughters of God and sisters and brothers to each other, like if that's our primary starting point, we're all on the same playing field, no matter what title somebody has or what paycheck somebody gets. And so on the other hand, if the scorecard is about sending and sharing and disciple making, um, then there's no way that the pastor or staff or quote unquote professionals can be the only people involved because that would be such a small percentage of any church uh, th that it's always going to be like missing whatever new marks we hit. Um, and so in Ephesians four, Paul talks about the gift of grace that, that, that leads to unity and, and personal growth and maturity. And he also talks about how the church's role is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so he gives variously gifted people. And in our churches, we know there's some, you know, yes, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, even just to play that out further. Like we know there's some upfront leaders and some behind the scene leaders and some rallyers and some influencers. And just, I mean, God is so intricately woven different aspects of his glory and his giftedness into different people. But if that's true, it's all for the upbuilding of the body, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, then who does the work of ministry? It's everybody. 
-hmm. But if everybody's going to be involved, then it requires trust and reliance on the spirit. And it requires the, the interrelated shifts from church leaders to say, we expect you and we're going to create and promote opportunities for you to be involved. Um, and so they're interrelated, but they're a little bit differently. Uh, but these are the the shifts in the church. The, it, the shift in expectation is a question. And, and I have to pause and ask this, and our team has to pause and ask this probably once or twice a year. Are we creating a culture where followers of Jesus move from consumer and convert into being a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple to the fourth generation? Um, so in other words, are we creating the expectation that that God's work and disciple making isn't just for the elite or second level Christians. It's it's the expectation for everyone to be involved in that Second Timothy two lineage. Um, but if we expect folks to that to, to to step into that, we also have to give them the opportunities. And so the church must shift from a view of people as merely volunteers in the church. This may be the one that most folks cringe most at um, shift from merely being volunteers in the church to, to being a missionary sent into a mission field. Um, I love John 17. I'm going to preach on John 17 to kick off our, our fall in our own church here in a couple of weeks. It's one of the weirdest prayers in the Bible though, of Jesus saying to his father, I'm coming home, but don't take your people out of the world. Give them the spirit, give them protection as you send them into the world. And a challenging question for me is, do we as churches actually pull people out of the world by showing them that their highest and best is to serve in some role on a Sunday morning? Mm. But God, the father answers the prayer of his son by empowering his people with the spirit. And so part of our goal in our own church is, is to help people discover their gifts and their mission field, and then to pray and equip them in those gifts and mission fields. Um, and so, for example, Ashley and Curtis, great couple in our church. Uh, Ashley worked with refugees, which is, as we know, like large populations of people coming to a different uh, to a different part of the world. Um, in North Texas, there was a lot of refugee services, but very little to help asylum seekers, which is when one person or a couple people or a family come. Um, and Ashley's heart broke for an asylum seeker friend who came to refugee services, and they didn't have anything for this friend. And so they said, great, come sleep on our couch. Um, and then as networks of people who are displaced go, uh, one refugee or one asylum seeker sleeping on their couch led to multiple asylum seekers sleeping on multiple people's couches. And after a few years, it became uh, an organization called Dash. And to date, they've fed and helped legal fees and resettled over 300 asylum seekers. Um and that was Ashley going, I have this passion and the church coming alongside her and saying, yes, like we want to help you thrive in this. And man, it got messy for a little while. Um, it also meant that Ashley didn't serve a ton on Sundays. Um, and so a choice we've made in our church is to run Sundays as lean as possible because we'd rather see people make disciples in everyday life rather than thinking that their highest and best is to direct cars in a parking lot. And I also want to say, like, if someone's not doing anything, directing cars in a parking lot's a great first step. Mm -hmm. But it's a question of what are we calling people to? What what leader pipelines are we developing? And how are we celebrating relationship leadership over task-based leadership? And what opportunities do people have to be equipped? And it's questions like that. Um, and I'll do the last shift very quickly, and then we can take more questions and have a conversation. But but, but I hope you can see why all of these are, they're church-wide shifts. They're, they're culture shifts, not just vision shifts or not just one department. Um, and so the final shift is kind of an outflow uh, of the rest of these. It's asking the question, what is our operating system? Um, and so we define this as a shift from a bias of no to a bias of yes. Um, frankly, it would have been easier and cleaner if we had told Ashley, no, if you want to do asylum seeker stuff, like that's on your time, go do it. It gets messy for the church to get involved in resettlement and legal things. Um, but instead we wanted to say like, there's a lot of folks who need Jesus coming from places that they're hurting, they're faithless or other faiths. We'd love to help equip you in this. And and that's our church. I've worked with dozens of churches over 10 years. Bill's worked with way more churches over way more years who are trying to find their place in the world of multiplication and sending church planners and missionaries. And in my experience, the number one thing that holds everyone back is this mindset of we're not something enough. 
Mm. Our church isn't doesn't have enough money. Our church doesn't have enough people. We don't have enough to leaders to backfill the leaders that are sent. And so we believe this subtle lie, the millionaire lie, how much money is enough? I'll, I'll tell you when I get there. Mm-hmm. And churches say, well, maybe it'll be next year. And and I can tell you from church of 4,000 people in our city, they still don't feel like enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, theologically, going back to what we say we believe, every church is few, full of humans and all humans are imperfect and messy and needy. Um, and also theologically only Jesus is sufficient and only Jesus is enough, but he loves his people and he's the head of his church and he's got people who don't know that they're his people yet. And so God gives us all we need and empowers us to send. And so if we wait for some magic metric, we'll never feel like we're enough. And so this final shift from no to yes is a step in faith and it's a step in obedience, and frankly, we'll feel a little bit like Jesus did with his disciples. If we believe in these other shifts and and leaders move from, from the leaders move from doing mission and ministry to equipping others for it, then it means that we embrace the risk and depend on God as we send some people into their mission field, just like Jesus did with his disciples. And then we come back and talk about what, what did go well and what didn't go well. And we continue to equip them as they learn to thrive in their gifts. But the mm-hmm. operating system has to move from control to permission. Let's lead folks, equip them, and correct them, yes, but with a heart of supporting them and thriving as we move from no into yes. Mm. So good. So good. Um, we do have a couple of questions. And mm-hmm. the first one, um, I want to point towards that um, shift that where where every believer has both an opportunity and there's an expectation for them to make disciples. And um, so this question is, what are the key elements for reproducing disciples? You know, I think, I I don't think you have to convince anybody, should we be making disciples? I mean, Jesus gave us the great commission. We know that we should be, but what does that actually look like in real life? Like what are the tangible, uh, you know, and especially for those that are joining us, they're not a pastor, they're not a small group leader. Mm-hmm. They're maybe a team member at, on a Sunday morning. Like, what does that look like for just an everyday believer that they would shift into someone who actually makes more disciples? Yeah, I've talked a lot on the last few minutes, so I'm going to let Bill, well, let I, Bill give actually, you. Actually, you literally wrote the book on this so go, you, go <laughs> ahead I, I, I give i have something i want to share on that but but go ahead go ahead and, and okay I'll... okay fine uh, i think a key element is is helping people see that discipleship and ministry and just even walking with jesus is far more an everyday reality than it is a just when the church is gathered reality and there are some aspects of discipleship that certainly happen best or most when the church is together um but a lot of discipleship, and we see this throughout the New Testament, happens in a smaller group of folks walking together, carrying out all the one another commands. Um, and, and if we can just help people start to see what it looks like to love one another, to bear each other's burdens, to actually have a gospel conversation, e- even if it starts within their own community, but to say like, oh, it's not just the pastor, the church leader that that has a corner on the market of talking about Jesus without it being weird. Um, then I think it, that sounds so small and we don't love to like celebrate small things. We love to celebrate big things, but if that's never happened in someone's life or group before, it's actually disproportionately a huge thing. And so I think the the question is starting small and how can we give away some responsibility and equip folks to, to small things might be the seed that eventually leads to new groups, new churches, new movements of churches. Yeah. So you're saying that, that friends that are doing life together could disciple each other, essentially. I think think the Bible invites us into that exact thing over and over again. Yes. I mean, just to give like a tangible example, it's very fresh and relevant in my own life is that we just, um, as a church had a really striking tragedy where, um, we lost a a teenage boy, um, mm. uh, 16 years old life cut way too short. And just the way that we've watched, um, friends, you know, people doing life with this family, the way they've laid down their lives for this family, literally for two weeks as we've been in and out of ICU and, and all of this, um, 
and you just see discipleship happening, even though it's not, they're not gathered around a table, like, you know, digging into a scripture, they're literally living out what it means to serve one another in love. And, and I just watch discipleship happening in a real life experience it's it is so much about just doing life together and growing together as you're Mm. processing your own spiritual walk um and so yes i i think that it it really is something that's applicable to every believer no matter whether they're a leader or not so it's it's interesting when um ben referenced the hero maker book that uh uh, the dave ferguson warren bird wrote and they pulled out a statistic um uh, i think it was from dan spader but we don't know exactly how Jesus spent all of his time because we don't have all 24 hours of the three plus years of ministry. But what God chose to preserve in the Gospels, for some reason, 73% of Jesus' time was spent with some iteration of the 12. Uh, that clearly demonstrated he could gather, you know, crowds, uh, crowds larger than most of us ever could, you know, in a church. And And if his approach was, let's make the funnel as big as we can at the top, and then hopefully we'll get disciples out of that. That clearly wasn't his approach. His approach was investing in a small group of people over a period of time to make them disciple makers. And that launched, you know, the greatest movement that the, the world has ever seen. Yet we, we tend to default to the sort of the big funnel uh, approach. And that, and again, not to, to say that that's evil or anything like that, but if, if that's, if that's all you're thinking about, and sometimes that level three magnet is drawn, you know, it draws is so powerful that uh, we don't get into really the fundamentals of what, what Jesus has called us to. So true. So true. One final question. Then I have a couple of announcements um, to close us up with, but um, this question is for someone who is loving all this material. Um, they're they're wondering um, how how can you build some of these shifts into the culture when you're not the main leader and you want to kind of influence upward. How how would you communicate these shifts up the chain of command, so to say? Yeah, with a lot of humility for one. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I, like there's 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 two things that come to mind. One is is first and foremost prayer. Um, that that I mean God is the only one able to do anything fruitful um, on a long-term sustainable thing or in a real way. And so like the unity of a church staff and vision and direction, um, we can try to force it. We do sometimes try to force it, but, but how much more freeing would it be to, to trust the Lord? And so to start by submitting to prayer and I know prayer can feel like a throwaway at times, but I really do think like if, if in that specific scenario, like start to pray for the leader, start to pray for the church that, that the spirit would go ahead and soften hearts and, and prepare for unity. Um, and then the second thing I would say real briefly is, is uh, help, help people understand that who they are in, in Christ. Cause, mm-hmm. cause the how to like Paul in the new Testament never starts his letters with hi, I'm Paul. Here's a list of things for you to go do now. It's always this reminder of, of you are a beloved son or daughter. You you are created to to image God forth. You're a saint. You're a missionary. You're part of God's family. And so just reminding people like this is, it's not a question of should you just go do this or not. Mission and reproduction and multiplication is, is part of who God has made us to be. And if we can start with just calling us back to our identity in Christ, then on one level, it's unarguable. <laughs> Um, uh, on another level, it just, it helps us have a, a deeper motive than just, oh, here's a new idea. Here's a new to-do list kind of thing. So good. What do you say, so Bill? Good. You guys, our time is up already. I can't believe it. We flew through this hour, but I did want to, um, just encourage everybody who's loving this material. Um, first of all, to check out this book, I know it's backwards on the screen, but Hero Maker by Dave Ferguson and Warren Bird. Um, I have read this book several times. It's highlighted lots of notes in there. This is like the kind of book you're going to keep on your desk for many years as a reference. Um, But really, uh, if you're wanting to know how somebody (laughs) somebody on there. Hold on. I think. I'm going to speak over it. I think it's a glitch. Everybody's muted, but (laughs) um, 
I can hear you fine. So. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what that is, but um, so we, we really encourage you here. Maker is everywhere. Books are sold. You can get it on Amazon at your local bookstore. Highly encourage you to get that book and share it with your, your, your leaders and those uh, at church. I also want to um, encourage you to, we've got a couple of slides of some things that are coming up. Uh, first one is, ooh, there are, <laughs> we uh, have the Hero Makers cohort that is going to be launching uh, this October. It's an online cohort, and we're going to be uh, really diving into a lot of the material from the Hero Maker book. But we have uh, an online course from Exponential that we will be um, uh, going through together, and we'll have a couple of online group discussions uh, throughout that time period. So this is for everybody, whether you are a church leader, you are a pastor, if you are on staff, if you are just, you know, someone that goes to church, this is for everybody. Um, and it's, this is the best part. It's free. It is free for everybody. So we will have in the chat here, we'll have a link where you can sign up, tell us that you're interested in joining that cohort. And then the next thing that we wanted to share with you is we have our multipliers learning community that is um, going to be beginning in November. Uh, there are only 25 spots open at the moment. Uh, we will have a wait list if those spots fill up, fill up. So if you're interested, please head over to the link that we have provided. Um, this is really right now just an interest page. You can uh, click one of the links there. It will take you to a uh, um, a form where you can say, yes, I, I want to join this group. It's not the actual registration, but we'll at least have your name in there um, that you're that you're interested in it. So we um, are super excited about that. Please check out the links that we've provided. We'll send out an email with all of this stuff as well. And uh, we cannot wait for all that's coming up. Bill and Ben, thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing with us today with and we look forward to our our multipliers learning community coming up this this year yeah i'll be excited to walk with some of you thank you so much for today and the fire hose that we just you know turned on everybody <laughs> yes. yeah good to be with you yes yeah. thank you guys have a wonderful day you too